We are recording the interview of John Sweet. This interview is being conducted by David Berry from the Wright State University's Veteran Voices Project. This interview is being recorded at the Holiday Inn Hotel in Fairborn, Ohio. It is 3 p.m. on June 7th, 2019. So why don't we start with where and when were you born? Marblehead, Massachusetts, August 24th, 1947. My twin brother and I were the last set of twins born in town. And then, uh, who was your parents and what did they do? My mother was uh, Virginia Thoner. Family had lived in town since the 1730s. Mm -hmm. And uh, she was just a young girl. Met a Marine on the Mighty Mo when it pulled in after World War II. My dad was from Kansas, and uh, his family had originally been from Salem, Mass. Arrived in 1630, and they all served in wars, and when they got a piece of land, they migrated farther west because they were millwrights. <clears throat> and uh, he was on the Mighty Mo when the Japs surrendered on the second gun turret right over him. Pretended to be tying his shoe, bent down and snapped a picture of him signing the documentation. And uh, that's how they met, got married, and that's why I was born in Marblehead. And then, uh, I got this little fly buzzing around my head. Oh, sorry about that. <clears throat> uh, outside of your father, did you have any other members of, the, of your family to serve the military? Serve in the military? My father was killed in Korea. I'm sorry to hear that. And so I really didn't have a dad when I was growing up. I was an inner city kid, and uh, my mom did the best she could. Uh, so what were you doing before you joined the military? Well, depends upon how official this record becomes. I, this is informal, and it's your okay. story. I was... Uh, Working in a pharmacy as a carbonic engineer, a soda jerk. And uh, it turned out that my actual job was the, the old man that ran the place named Healy died. Another man took over and not only was he a pharmacist, but he ran a whorehouse and uh, he was a bookie. So when I was thought I was delivering prescriptions, I was the bag man. So. Uh, the cops used to come in at 9 o'clock every night, lock the door behind them, get a half a glass of soda water, and go in and get a shot of Jack Daniels, and uh, get their take and place their own bets. So when I was going into the Air Force, my last night I poured myself a half a glass of soda water, took out two bucks, and went in the back room and said, second race, second nag, give me a shot of that. And they said, of course, get the hell out of here. And then I, uh, Tech Sergeant Warner down in Salem, Massachusetts was signing me up. And I failed the physical down in Boston at the Navy Yard. They said I had too much albumin. Uh, didn't have a clue what that was at the time, but he went back and told him. And, he was sitting there with his tie off and unshaven, and he said, you want to get in, tiger? I said, yeah. He said, don't eat anything for three days. Drink lots of water and come back. I'll get you down there, and you'll pass. So I did. Then after basic, I got into tech school at Lowry. I was going to be a 234, a precision photographic processing specialist for satellite reconnaissance. And... Um, I got called into my commander's office and accused of getting in under a fraudulent enlistment. I don't know how he found out, but he had two guys march me down to the hospital and, and do a test, and I passed. He said if I didn't pass, I was going to go to Leavenworth, but I passed, so I got to stay in. But I washed out of the tech school after eight months because I failed a block by one point because there was a lot of chemistry and higher mathematics. So I got called into the commander's office, started chewing me out, 
He said, you know, you've gone back for remedial training on every block, he says, and now you just flunked the block because you didn't copy over the answer right from the graph. And I said, sir, I wasn't sure which point on the graph was the correct answer. And he said, well, this, you know, calculus and chemistry picked up from what you had in high school. And this is the last block of enlisted men allowed through this course. And I said, I never had chemistry or calculus in high school. And he said, well, I don't see how you managed to make it this far. He says, I'm washing you out. I'm not going to allow you to continue in this course. I'm taking you out without prejudice. So that was that. Then I ended up being assigned to Headquarters Western GIA, Ground Engineering Electronics Installation Agency and uh, got into administration. But I still had my top secret security clearance, so they wanted to put me to good work. So when I got shipped over to Southeast Asia, the uh, Air Force Communications Service had taken over uh, GIA, and uh, I was assigned to the 1987th Communications Squadron at Nakam Phanom. So they said, well, with your top secret clearance, we're going to put you to work in the Tactical Units Operations Center handling all the classified and all, all of the message traffic from the message distribution center. And uh, we think that somehow the enemy is getting the frag reports for the arc light strikes. So we're effectively changing as of this date everybody that handles those reports so it will be two new guys that come in off the planes and that's going to be your job along with all the message traffic and there won't be anybody else to get it until the briefing for the pilots because the 01 and 02 facts have to know where not to be when the when the arc light strikes are dropped because they're dropped from way up high and the little planes fly low and they could actually get hit by the bombs if they were in the, in, in the way for, a, you know, an arc like to strike. And uh, at that base was Task Force Alpha, which was McNamara's electronic warfare. And the idea was they could have these sensors. Once the Navy pilots, they figured out, we, we can't use these guys, so they started using um, C-130s and uh, helicopters. But they had to get these sensors dropped in, in pretty accurate positions. And then Task Force Alpha was actually the world's largest uh, computer that the military owned, a 360-60, with a 360-20 at the comm center. And it, the whole idea behind it was that they played a game of ping pong, figuring out where the next flipper would be. Only the flipper was where the troops, tanks, jeeps, whatever, uh, coming down the Ho Chi Minh Trail would be next. And the idea was to figure it out so that they could <clears throat> come in with the arc light strikes and hit them. And uh, <clears throat> the North Vietnamese, after a while, figured out where Task Force Alpha was. One of the O2 facts, uh, who, I, who I won't identify, uh, was shot down, uh, he was with the 23rd TAS, he was shot down in Laos, spent six months in a cave, one of only two or three men to ever get out of Laos, because they were basically a Stone Age people, and you know, you'd been killing them, and uh, they didn't take prisoners, normally. But he was taken up to the Hanoi Hilton after a while, one of his greatest fears was that the Americans would bomb the hell out of him on the way north to go to the prison. But he made it up there and then they beat the shit out of him until uh, he finally identified every single building at Nakam Phanom. And his greatest fear, he told me personally, and hadn't, didn't tell many, that the base would be overrun and that he would feel responsible because the place was called Naked Fanny partially because it did not really have any defenses other than the fact that it was 
on the Thai side of the river. But Nakhon Phanom was well known to be surrounded by what they called Thai communists. But Isan, the whole northeast section of Thailand, if you look at a map and you look what, at what Laos looks like, you'll notice almost immediately that the eastern part of Thailand cuts into the center part of Laos because the Thais made a deal with the French and they took that part of Laos. The river, the Mekong, was the highway. In Europe, rivers are borders between countries, but in Asia, the rivers are the highways between peoples. So all these people had their cousins, their brothers, everybody else on both sides of the river. Well, some say 1898, some say 1908, but what, whatever year you look at, all these ethnic tribal people, various ethnics, the Thais never went up there and helped them. They left them like living strictly Stone Age like they were for centuries. No roads, no electricity, no hospitals. But they did put in teachers and police and military. So the Pathet Lao came across the river and said, fight with us, we'll get our country back. But to the American soldiers sent off there as 19, 20 year old GIs, we all got brochures, welcome to Thailand. Well, we're not up with ethnic Thais. We're up with people that don't speak Thai. They speak Pu Thai. They speak various tribal dialects. Sometimes they can't even understand each other two villages away. And they had taken some of these people to China and trained them as insurgents, worked with the North Vietnamese. The Vietnamese lived in town as well. One third of the people in Nakhon Phanom were uh, Vietnamese refugees from the first Indochina War who had fled across the border into Thailand, but they weren't accepted as Thai citizens. So they lived along the banks of the river and couldn't even own the property. They were just squatters. Well, it didn't take much effort for the North Vietnamese to reach that community, especially since Ho Chi Minh officially now has been recognized as living in the small village just a mile away from the gate of Nakhon Phanom Royal Thai Air Force Base. It's been opened up and General Lederholt, who led and, and set up all the Lima sites in Laos working with Bill Lair, commanded the 56. And he went back with me in 2002, signed the guest book after it had been officially sanctioned by the North Vietnamese as where Ho lived between 28 and 31. And he signed it with the following. If Ho Chi Minh had been on our side, we would have won the war. Downtown, there's a clock tower that's famous. All the guys called it the Ho Chi Minh clock tower. When I went back in 97 on my first trip to find the orphanage that we assisted during the war and brought Santa Claus, I was on my way to central China by invitation of a deputy secretary of the party. And I managed to get up into Nakhon Phanom. The Thais had started sending commercial planes up twice a week. And I'd managed to find Father Kai, who ran the orphanage. But now he was Archbishop of Thailand. Spoke seven languages, all fluent, Latin, English. We went downtown and I asked him, what does it say in the two languages on the clock tower? And he says, given to the Vietnamese community of Nakhon Phanom by a former grateful resident, 1960. So we all think it really was donated by Uncle Ho. But the Vietnamese underground uh, was working well against the American presence at Nakhon Phanom. 
I ran into a Thai professor. Finding the actual history of Isan is extremely difficult because you can't trust Thai history. But this guy was a Thai who used the history of Isan for his thesis, for his PhD, and he spoke excellent English. And it was 500 pages long with great, a great many facts and details, even concerning the war and the underground system for the North Vietnamese there. I asked him if I could get his permission to put it on my website. And now I send all the guys to go read his dissertation because it's amazing. And the Americans wanted a presence at Nakhon Phanom, and the Thais wouldn't allow us to be there because it's actually halfway up Laos and the closest point you can get to on the Ho Chi Minh Trail. And we wanted to cut it in half. So what happened was the Thai started being killed. The military, the school teachers, the police, just like South Vietnam. And they finally said, we're losing too many people. You create a counterinsurgency program and we'll let you come to our base, but we're still going to call it a Royal Thai Air Force Base. But you come out in the field and work with us and eliminate what we call a Thai communist. Now I can only say I've heard rumors, I know there was fighting, but I've heard rumors that American gunships were actually used in 67, but I haven't found any proof yet, only people that told me they did. Um, but Aderhold set up the 56, worked with Bill Lair who had trained the Paru, I don't know if you've heard about the Paru or not, paramilitary police under Bill Lair went over there under the CIA. And Bill set that up and ran it, and Heidi, Heine set up all the Lima sites. And they were working for Sullivan, the ambassador in Laos. But they were under control of the 7th Air Force. And the, the guy that headed, Myermir, headed the 7th Air Force, and he hated Aderholt because Aderholt uh, he had been in Tibet, he'd been working with the CIA, you know, all this sort of thing. And he was a gung-ho guy and a straightforward shooter, but he would do what it takes to get the job done. So all the people at NKP were air commandos. You showed up on that base, didn't matter where you came from, you got an air commando hat, you told the boss your boots, and you were, an, you were an air commando because first and foremost, that was an air commando base Nothing else mattered to them except the mission. And you were part of it, and you were going to stay part of it, and you were going to be gung-ho, or you were going to be gone. And all the men loved him. He'd go around 2 o'clock in the morning, make rounds everywhere with all the men. Wonderful guy. Long story short, all I did was handle message traffic. Sometimes flash eyes only, you have to deliver it to a colonel two o'clock in the morning after he got back from a night mission on his Sky Raider up in the plane of jars or something. But that, that was the mission of the base, interdiction of the trail, search and rescue. You know, that was, that was the primary mission. And uh, Task Force Alpha was the largest computer the military had, buried underground, 230 miles from Hanoi. They knew it was there. They beat the hell out of this guy. There was nothing. We had no, no effective, uh, you know, we had wires around and some claymores, but man, if they had, if they had managed to take even a half a division of guys, they would just fly over, overrun it. We had an alert one night. We were out at the outdoor movie theater. The yellow flare goes up. And everybody says, oh shit, well, it's just yellow. And boom, boom, red flares go up. Everybody's supposed to, you know, report duty stations, take your weapons. They did it, but they all knew it was a catastrophe. All these young guys had never fired a weapon since basic training. They, they got one, two magazines, 
okay? They're scared as hell. And they'll shoot anything that moves. The word is they actually got a couple of guys on the wire and they think they were a forward element. They hit it. They hit it from the ties. They hit it from the guys on the base as much as they could. They didn't want the ties to find out that there had been an, an attempt because they were afraid that the ties would tell the Americans to get the hell out of them. So, and I got that from real good sources, but I, I don't want to quote them. And um, as, far, as far as, you know, I only got off base like five or six times. I worked from two o'clock in the afternoon until seven o'clock the following morning. And uh, I alternated with one other guy for that shift every other day. And I had to stay an extra two weeks in order to get a replacement. So how long in total were you in Thailand? Uh, well, 12 and a half months. I arrived on my birthday. So it was easy for me to remember. And I, I was in the C-130 when I, actually we had two incidences on the way over. I uh, took off from Travis. We got an hour out on a Continental Airline. They had a problem with one of the engines, so we turned around and came back to Travis. <laughs> there was this one kid on board, never been on a plane before, but he's Air Force. And as soon as he heard there was a problem, we're turning back to Travis, he stood up and he goes running down the aisle screaming, is there a Catholic chaplain on the plane? And this senior master sergeant grabbed him and said, shut up and sit down. <laughs> So we landed at Travis, but we left after midnight, so we lost a day's tour credit. We took off, we landed at Hawaii, and uh, I don't know why, I called my mother on the phone from Hawaii and told her about the incident, but I'm fine. And we took off from Hawaii, and we got two hours away from Clark, and we hit a real serious uh, turbulence. And you know how it goes, everybody had just been served food. I don't know the type of the plane, but there were three bathrooms in the rear. And I was sitting like two rows up from maybe four or five rows up from the, from the back. And I was sitting in the middle seat between these two guys from Wright Pat who were, uh, uh, you know, uh, techs for uh, working in the dispensary, for e EMTs, and uh, I had just undone my seat belt. This is my luck when we hit the turbulence. So I grab onto the arms of the chair, but they come up. So I'm going up in the air, holding on to them, and the guy pushes me back into the seat next to me. And he says, "Don't panic." And I said, "I'm not panicking. I'm just reaching for the seat belt." Well, there was a stewardess next to us. She got slammed up against the roof. And it, she stayed there for a while. I mean, we dropped a long way. And then she slammed down into the floor. Well, when you come out, you go up and down a second time. So tech sergeant reached across, spread, you know, straddled the seats and grabbed it and so she wouldn't go up and down a second time. But it was, uh, we found out it was actually kind of too late for her. She'd already had a broken back when she hit. But she was still alive and everything. The other stewardess had landed and had a slash to the bone straight like this across her face. And there was uh, one guy, there were three guys in the crappers, and everything in the crappers came up and down. And they were in 1505s, which are tan colored you know, like your fatigues, sort of. And they were just covered. And the guy in the middle couldn't even come out because the woman with the broken back was in the way of opening the door. So two hours later, we landed at Clark and uh, they had ambulances meet us on the tarmac and the, everybody on the plane, you know, headed to a war zone. They all felt bad, so they all threw in like five bucks a piece for the girls. But 
we never heard what, what happened afterwards. I tried to find out a couple of times, but it was so, so many years later that I couldn't find out any information. And uh, that was on the way over. And when I got to Bangkok, to Don Wong, I opened the door, the plane, and just the stench that came in the door was amazing. I don't know how it was for you in Afghanistan, but you could tell, I mean, it was ripe. And uh, I had the unfortunate good timing of arriving about a half an hour before the Klong Hopper was headed north. So I never got a night in Bangkok uh, before going up country. And I remember looking out of that C-130 at Nakhon Phanom as we were coming up, because we circled it. And all, all you could see was this brown square patch and a sea of jungle all around you. And you knew, I knew I was going out there because we tried to look up the APO number uh, five, five digit numeric is for all the bases in the world and it wasn't in the book and as I say I had a classified clearance so uh, the tech sergeant McDonald says to me must be in the other book which was confidential so we opened that one and there it was and uh, Staff Sergeant Tucker says to me Ooh, you're going out there. And yeah, NKP was out there, but it was the best assignment I had in the military. And I, I think you'd find every single guy that you interview say the same thing. So that's part of some of the memories about getting over there I thought I'd throw in. You must have uh, more questions, but I want to make sure I have no, I mean, this is all about the uh, your story and how you want to tell it. Okay, so... I can sit back and listen and let you go on, or... Okay. Like. So, um, you know, we, we had uh, one prank we like to pull on the new guys is uh, we had these uh, bugs that uh, the Thais used to eat, and they'd, they'd collect them with uh, plastic bags and a flashlight in the clongs, and... Uh, they called them rice bugs, but actually they were they were a form of uh, large brown cockroach, and they used to walk sideways like crabs, and they were attracted to light. That's why they had little flashlights. But outside the MDC where I worked, inside the Tactical Units Op Center compound, which was surrounded by a fence, uh, we had an overhead light outside the steel door, and the door had a window in it. And we take the new guy and put him outside as a guard at night, turn on the light, which had a shielded overhead like this, and the light would shine down. Well, the rice bug clong would come out of the clong towards the light. So after a few minutes with the light on, you know, the guy would knock on the door and he'd slide him. What? There's some there's some bugs out here crawling out. Oh yeah, they're poisonous. Just step on them, slam the door. And uh, after a while, they'd be banging. Let me in! Let me in! Let me in! So that was one of the kind of cruel jokes we played. But uh, we had, you know, a, a open air theater, and they. I remember they played this movie, Romeo and Juliet, with Olivia Hussey. Well, she had been in the play, Playboys uh, in the centerfold, and she was a young kid. There was issues over her age and being in the centerfold, but uh, she had a great set of lungs, and everybody wanted to watch that movie for the one shot where she sits up in bed and the sheet drops. So it's pouring rain out, and we're all sitting there, and the light from the projector is barely getting to the screen and uh, the scene comes on she sits up and this black bar comes across her chest and it says censored US Armed Forces everybody starts throwing their beer at the screen 
and then it starts raining harder. So, I mean, we were used to it raining hard, but this was like monsoon rain. And it started raining so hard that the light from the projector couldn't reach the screen. So at that point, people started going up by where the projector was, and there, the projector had a little shelf over it, probably, I don't know, four feet wide. And all these guys are trying to get underneath it. I mean, you're already soaked, but at least you're not getting beat to death. And a guy says, uh, he was a captain. He says, it wasn't supposed to rain tonight. Some, somebody else uh, said to him, how the fuck would you know? And somebody else said, he's a fucking weather officer. So they pushed him out so he couldn't be underneath you. <laughs> One night, I was down at the post office, and I had a few beers, and there was this captain. And somebody must have hated the poor bastard because he was down on his hands and knees and somebody gave him the mailbox in the bottom right-hand corner of the post office. And of course, it's only a little box this big. I don't know what you, know, you, you guys had. And it had a little dial on it, A, B, C, D, E. Well, he was so drunk that all he could do was stare at the letter that he wanted and he couldn't remember the code to open his box. And he's crying. So, you know, I come walking by and I said, What's the matter, Captain? <laughs> oh. See, you want that letter? Yeah. Picked up a rock. Now I'm half in the bag, too. Picked up a rock, smashed the shit out of it. He reaches in, gets the letter, and he says, Thank you. So, I mean, it's dumb stuff like that. Oh, I got another one. This is even funnier. I'm walking towards the Tuwok to go to work. And we all had these Air Commando hats. You've seen probably some of the guys with the green hat. Looks like an Aussie hat, similar. Well, most of them here have repros because they do, the original ones are pretty well shot. I do have my original one. Every month we would put a black stripe on the front of the hat. So people could immediately tell if you knew what the hell you were doing, what was going on. So I am walking down, I had like eight, nine, nine stripes in my hat. And I'm walking towards this lieutenant who's in stateside fatigues, starched, okay, with bright silver wings. Nobody wore that stuff. He just got there. And nobody saluted. And he passes me. I'm not going to salute because we don't. And he salutes me. Okay, well, <laughs> this is great. You know, the FNG is saluting me. <laughs> so I didn't want to get in trouble, so I saluted him back lefty. And, of course, at that point, he stops me. Sergeant. I turn around and, yes, sir. And he says, uh, the sun was in my eyes, and I thought those marks on your hat that you were a captain. And I said, <laughs> just laughing, and he says, I'm ordering you to take those marks off your hat. And the only time I ever said no to an officer was then. <laughs> I'm just still laughing. I said, no, sir. And he said, I'm giving you a direct order to take those marks off your hat. And then Colonel Kovacs walked up, my commander. And he looks at And this guy goes immediately <laughs> to a salute to Kovacs. Kovacs looks at him, looks at me, puts his hands on his hips, and says, what seems to be the problem here, Sergeant Sweet? Because <laughs> he knows he's new. In the meantime, the lieutenant's looking at Kovacs, who's there with a great big handlebar mustache, which is unauthorized and black marks all around his kernels. And the guy goes, swallows hard. And I says, might as well play with it. I said, oh, nothing, sir. The FNG just doesn't know what's going on. And he says to him, oh, 
And he's still holding the salute, waiting for the return salute. And Kovac says to him, oh, he says, I see that you just arrived, didn't you? Yes, sir. He's still holding the salute. So he says, and I see you're a pilot, aren't you? He says, are you a Sky Raider pilot? Yes, sir. And he says, well, he says, you know what Sergeant Sweet does? No, sir. He says, well, it's his job to go and pick up your hot shot ass when you get shot down. Now, if you piss him off, do you think he's going to want to pick you up? But Kovacs knew I didn't do it. <laughs> anyway, that was funny. Um, as far as the mission, you know, it was a sad thing when guys got killed because they flew off and didn't come back. If they couldn't get picked up, it was a death sentence usually. And I, we had one mission where they had fought real hard to get this pilot out, and they worked it, then worked the SAR for days. They got in there, and of course the, they were doing a lot of suppressant, and then a lot of CBUs dropped, and a lot of a lot of bombs going around everywhere, trying to, you know, keep these people away from them. And they finally thought they had them. Sent the helicopter in and while this is happening right when they think they can finally get them all of us that worked in that compound are in that on guard room listening on the radios and then that bird got shot down that was trying to pick him up and then all those crew members were on the ground and then another bird goes in picks them up got them all they say, we got them, we're headed out. And the radios go dead, lost all of them. And that was probably the most tragic moment that I can remember. And we were all helpless, couldn't, couldn't do anything. You know, they were miles away. And the master sergeant that, that ran the radios just went nuts picked up the chair and slammed it into the radios just and the rest of us did you know get out get out so it was pretty pretty sad a lot of the guys didn't know what was going on a lot of the guys that worked on the base you know I don't know why they didn't know but the planes came back shot up and they they thought they were fighting in South Vietnam they, they didn't know we had in, you know, loud troops being trained. We, we had ties being trained. We had shot up Laos coming back in planes that well, they were supposed to go to Udorn, but sometimes they just was closer to go to NKP. We only had a, you know, dispensary, a little clinic, and yet they were so shot up, they'd, they'd haul them in and try to get them treated there. But when they when they take them off the planes, they'd immediately put them on to. They had two blue buses with blacked out windows, and they put them on that and then haul them over. They didn't want people to know. Everybody's job was in a compartment, and we were all kept separate. My hooch mate, for a year, actually worked at Task Force Alpha, and his job was repairing radios at Task Force Alpha. But he couldn't tell me what his job was. I couldn't tell him what my job was. He finally went on to my website, and I hooked up with him three and a half years ago, and uh, he's, been, he's been a visitor to my home, I've taken him around New England, I've been out to Oregon. His only stipulation was, don't tell my wife and kids what I did when I was there. So. It was, it was a very different kind of place, but everybody worked together and the mission was the primary focus. There was very little problems uh, with, with black and whites on the base. I saw there was nobody there when I was there that I ever heard of that was smoking any dope. Now I understand from others later that that was the case. Once they knew the war was lost and they were just like cannon fodder leftovers, then, uh, yeah, the attitudes changed, but it wasn't that way when I was there. 
I had two friends, one named Cross and one named Hillary. And, and, and uh, Hillary was black, Cross was white, and they were ac across from each other. They were, worked on the, uh, uh, on the helicopters. So I was walking in front of my own hooch one day and there was this tall black guy that I never saw before in my life. I think he only had one stripe. And we're walking by and he looks at me and he says, Yo mama. Okay. I said, Yo mama. And we're just walking by. So then suddenly he wants to fight. Well, I'm a little shit. He was a big tall guy. So Hillary was a staff sergeant, jumps in front, and he was a big guy. And he says, You want him? You got to go through a piece of me first. And the guy says, well, he said, your mama. And he says, well, you said his mama first. And the guy says, so? Like he's entitled. And that's the only incident that I actually had. But I got along good with, I had a lot of, you know, guys that were, it didn't matter to me if you were black or what, it just mattered how you treated somebody. Except the only guy I ever saw get in trouble was a new guy that was working the day shift in the uh, MDC. It was a staff sergeant named Sloda and a black guy named Lincoln who had just arrived. And the phone rang and uh, he picks up the phone and he says, yeah, my name's Abraham Lincoln, slams it down. I said, who is that? He's oh, some wise ass said his name was Hebel, whatever. I said, oh shit. He said, what? I said, you'll see. Well, this guy Hebel Gruber was a colonel that worked in the DO's office, right, 50 feet away. So he comes banging through the door, colonel does, almost ripping his name tag off his own shirt. You see that name, sergeant? <laughs> And uh, anyway, I guess I better move on to the modern part. Sure. Um, the rest of my tour was, you know, basically incidental, just an average, average tour. And uh, except one night, I could actually watch an arc light run from the top of the hill. The, there was a hill in, in back of Sunnyvale, and then you had to go downhill to go to the Chow Hall. And that was the highest point on the base. And you could see in here, this is midnight or so, when I went to Midnight Chow, you could actually hear, and barely hear, but you could hear the arc light strike and you could watch that line of fire just running up on the other side of the border. I don't know how many miles inland it was, but it must have been a good number because you could barely hear it, but you could hear it. And uh, the end of the war, there was actually a pretty good sized battle in, in uh, on the other side of Taket, but not when I was there. There was fighting there early in the war at Zipone, and uh, I, I've been all through that area since the war was over. But in 97, I went back and found the priest, and then wanted to find a way to help him more. And I stood on the last of the PSP from the pier steel planking, which was still there from where the Jollies parked. And I thought, I've got to do something for these guys that never came back. I've got to find a way for these guys to get back together. And got to find a way to help the kids. So when I got home, you know, like God helps you when you do the right thing. You don't even have to ask him, he'll just do it. The Air Commando Association asked me to write an article about getting back there. And the editor said, if you don't write it, I will. And nobody likes the way he writes. So when I wrote it, I th thought of the idea of, you know, if I could get Father Kai out there and collect some of those stones from the underlayment, from where those planes park that are covered with that the lateral light with the red dirt and the grease and the oil from the planes. Uh, if people send in a donation to help the kids, I'll send them a rock. 
Well, I started getting letters back, and uh, they'd underline in big letters, don't send me a rock, here's a donation for the kids. And I thought about it. I said, you know, maybe they don't want it because it's bad feelings from the war. So then they need healing. They need a rock. I sent this guy who had been with the 21st SOS, some of the, the outfit that lost some of the helicopters. I knew the pilot, and I sent him a rock. He didn't want it, but he, in, he was in charge of the disaster preparedness for Los Angeles. And it, in his office, he put a box on the wall and put his rock in it, shadow box. Another guy was a pilot for a classified ops called Barron's. And Barron 52 was his plane. He lost part of his right hand and part of his crew. He didn't want the rock, but he had it encapsulated, had his plane put on the rock. So we started, uh, I started get, getting money and uh, I was told, uh, hell, you have to become a nonprofit charity. Well, we had all decided to meet after we had all these emails going back and forth and I had set up a list server so they wouldn't all bounce all the time. Found a long-haired guy with a ponytail went down to his ass, but he liked what I was trying to do So he gave me the list server for 15 bucks and that was 20 years ago when they first had list servers And then everybody could hook up So we all ended up going about 85 of us to here to Dayton and We raised our hands to form an organization And we've been working at it ever since we have 600 members, and we've done uh, about $700,000 worth of direct aid in Northeast Thailand, in Nakhon Phanom Province, and in Central and Northern Laos up on the Plain of Jars, where a lot of the action took place. My wife and I have been over there every year since 97, except one. We had guys from USAID, we had guys who were CIA, we had guys who were probably spies, who read, write, and speak fluent Lao. Nobody knows why. No known source of income. You know, live there. They write up the contracts for us with the villagers. The villagers do the work. Our men local on the ground make runs up three or four times a year get new projects, check on the projects. Projects are always finished. There's never been any, any rip-off or anything like that. When General Aderholt died, he worked with us for the last 10 years of his life. He called me on the phone in 2001, and he said, this is, Heine Aderholt, do you know who I am? I said, yes, sir. He said, I like what you're doing. I don't want to be part of it. Well, the only thing he said to Heine was, yes, sir. So he raised $60,000 over the years by putting uh, requests for funds in the Air Commando newsletter. Everybody loved Heine. They'd do anything for him. So, uh, matter of fact, he told me he loved me a week before he died. And that, really special to me. He went over with me twice in 2002 and 2006. And we had a hell of a party. We, the locals came out, and they brought the old trucks out, they brought the, the jungle bands out. They had flags and banners all over downtown Nakhon Phanom to welcome the Americans back. But when push came to shove, we wanted to put a monument up in town. We worked at it for a year and a half, had it designed by a professional architect. We wanted to recognize the Thai and American forces that were lost because there was 20,000 Thais picked up called the Queen's Own, or known as the 333, that were fighting for the Americans sheep dipped. And a lot of them didn't come back when Mong Sui got overrun. But the American public knows nothing about those people. 
and the Thais worked with us and initially we had Americans doing translating but finally I found a, a, a friend of mine's wife who was Lao who had a degree in America and she spoke fluent uh, Lao, Thai and English and I brought her with me to talk to the mayor and the committees because it seems like things were getting stalled. Aderholt and I had dedicated a monument, a uh, big plaque made out of like a granite. And we had nine monks chanting and, you know, nice ceremonies. And Aderholt said to me, where's my speech? <laughs> I don't write speeches for general officers. You know? He wasn't happy with me that day. So he gave a nice speech, and uh, about six months later, the whole thing had been destroyed by some of the local Vietnamese community, probably, or those who had lost members fighting with the Pathet Lao. So anyway, she told me after the meeting, she said, they don't want it. They won't allow it. So now they have three monuments to Ho Chi Minh and none for the Americans and Thais. But it's worked out for us. There's been a lot of healing amongst these guys. And there's a lot of guys here who are not members of the TLC Brotherhood because they never heard of it. There's several Facebook groups that were started. And a couple of really good guys, you know, started different Facebook groups and they you know mentioned even tonight you know, we've had several several people join some guys still have animosity towards the Laos some officers as well as enlisted men and won't recognize the fact that the kids born today 95 percent probably of the Lao people were born since then or weren't involved in any any way other than getting the hell out of the way and these kids today in all these villages have five or six placards on their walls showing all of the different types of things that can kill them. I've been to villages with 2,000 pound bombs nosed in, never diffused, sitting next to the schools. I've been to villages where we've put in a, a, a library or built a shack for another school where uh, the leeches run up your legs and they hold classrooms in seven or eight of the bomb craters that are that big that they can actually put an entire class on the side of the crater with the teacher in the bottom to teach. And they welcome us. And they absolutely know who we are. When Aderholt died, we grubbed out a 20-acre farm in the jungle at across the, directly across the river at Tukat at an orphanage. We brought the Laos over to go 50 kilometers inland into Thailand with permission from the Thais to get training at the Agricultural College so they could run the farm. We went back a year and a half later. They had vegetables everywhere, fish in the ponds. But what the Laos had done was they had allowed us to put up a billboard-sized sign of Aderholt and the ded dedication in his memory in his full dress blue uniform and they didn't deface it. So they absolutely uh, appreciate everything we do. The uh, Zinc Kawang governor of the province gave us a certificate of official recognition for enhancing our American relations. We met with the American ambassador when we first started working over there. We cannot become an official NGO. We don't have phones, we don't have offices, we don't have salaries. Can't even fill out the form. You know, you, so the, uh, the Laos look the other way because unlike an NGO, we don't have any restrictive requirements. We sit down with them and say, well, what is it you need and how do you think we can best help you? We don't tell them anything. We work with them. 
So we approached the American ambassador who was in charge of the affair when we first started working with her, named Karen Stewart. Now she graduated first in her class from spy <coughs> school. So we knew, you know, we said, hey, uh, you know, they love us and they don't like you. Uh, you know, we, we help them, then they help us. Uh, why don't you try that? And uh, you've got a lot of money, but you don't spend any. How about if we come up with some projects and you can give us the dough and work with us? And nope, can't do that. But on the other hand, uh, I'll sit down with you on a Sunday afternoon and spend three hours with you because I like you and talk with you and have a good time. But I cannot officially sanction anything. But on the other hand, I'm not going to stop you. So that's, that's how it's been ever since. And uh, both countries officially look the other way. And uh, it's been interesting. My wife and I, uh, uh, there was another man who got in named Roger Warner, wrote the best book ever done on Laos called Shooting at the Moon. He was the first guy to get in, <coughs> bless you, to get into Long Cheng since the war. My wife and I were second along with an O1 Fat, who was the president of our organization, Bill Tilton. I was president a couple times. I was vice president for eight years. I was assistance chairman for a long time. but. We're going to get older and we're going to die off and this isn't going to last forever. But we sure as hell have had a hell of a good run. And we're still doing it. Mac died, the main guy that used to do our work in Laos, died from pancreatic cancer last November. Managed to see him before he passed. And uh, I don't have any immediate plans to go back again. I'm getting older. I've had cancer. I have lupus and Crohn's. Had to give up my motorcycle and getting weak. Sorry to hear that. Yeah, my wife liked to like to ride on the back of my 1200 and fall asleep. And I mean, a crazy little bastard. Sometimes I go through the mountains 70 miles an hour through thunderstorms and. Speed limit's 35, but I'm trying to get out of the storm. Just couldn't even see the double line by my feet. It was raining that hard. But, you know, I like the adrenaline surges, and I love the bike. That was the first thing I did when I got back, was went out and bought a motorcycle. You like the adrenaline, too. So, uh, basically, that's, the, you know, there's a lot, a lot more stories I could throw, but, you know, you've got other things to do, and it's... Uh, but this is probably one the best organization you'll ever find as far as guys who had actually served over there and in this sort of an environment, and yet they got the heart to raise these kind of funds and do that much good. I guess that's about it, unless you got some questions. I mean, you pretty much covered everything and more that I would have asked. Uh, I'm very grateful to have done this interview with you, and I just want to th say thank you for taking the time to do everything it is that you're doing, and thank you for taking the time to do this interview, and thank you for your service. Well, thank you very much.